Welcome to Investigating Cybersecurity Instance, a portion of the full Cybersecurity First Responder course from Logical Operations. My name is Stacy McBride, and I'll be your instructor for this course. The course is made up of three sessions, and in this first of three sessions on how to apply a forensic investigation plan, we'll be looking at uh, how to prepare for a forensic investigation. As a forensic analyst, there are many things uh, that you're going to need to do and uh, many things you're going to need to be aware of. And in order to start, first of all, we have to have a plan so that we understand how to handle forensics properly and how we can perform those forensics in compliance with any applicable laws and regulations, which is going to be very critical. During any single day, a forensic analyst might be called upon to do many different things. Uh, one of the things that is going to be very important is understanding uh, any laws uh, that may apply, any legal procedures that might need to be followed in order to properly collect and protect evidence. One of the things that we would be doing would be uh, trying to maintain a chain of custody for each piece of evidence so that we can document uh, who has had authority over it what they've done to it and uh, uh, you know how, who they've passed it on to, to ensure that there are no gaps in that chain of control. They're going to be uh, concerned with ensuring that as they collect the evidence, they're doing it using techniques that are uh, focused on attempting to preserve the admissibility of that evidence uh, in case it is needed to be used in a court of law. Now, obtaining evidence will follow uh, many different practices, but of course, computer crime scenes often will encompass more than just digital evidence. There will still be physical evidence in some cases, and so the analyst must identify the overall crime scene, which may in fact span more than one location because of the nature of cybercrime. Using various forensic methods is going to identify uh, the evidence, containers of evidence, and then attempt to recover that evidence, copying data that might be hidden, encrypted, uh, or in other ways obscured by the uh, intruder or attacker, and by so doing, try to put together a narrative that describes the steps that an individual took from the start to the end of the security incident. Now, once that's uh, done, of course, then these results need to be communicated and a lot of documentation needs to be produced as well in order to support that investigation. Uh, we need a formal way of presenting our technical findings so that they can also be analyzed by other forensic analysts to corro corroborate the findings as well. Now, the information that we gather uh, can come, as I said, from many sources, from across multiple systems, from network devices, and of course, today, mobile devices play a big part in forensic investigations uh, because of their uh, common usage. Additionally, uh, in days gone by, a lot of forensic analysis uh, may have focused primarily on the storage media, the, uh, the hard disks in systems. And while that's still uh, a primary source for evidence, we also understand the need to gather more volatile evidence today from memory, uh, keeping track of open network connections, uh, processes that are running on the system, and so on, because, of course, these also uh, can provide uh, valuable information in the investigation. One of the goals of the forensic analyst is to be able to support prosecution or a legal action. And so it's critical that as the evidence is collected, that um, of course it's done in a way that it can be used in a court of law. But additionally, the analyst must recognize that they may be called upon to provide technical evidence or act as an expert witness in court. And they may be cross-examined as to the procedures that they followed in collecting the evidence uh, in order to uh, establish its authenticity and trustworthiness. And so, obviously, the analyst has to have a broad skill set in this regard. And then, of course, because systems are continually changing, the analyst is going to need to maintain a current understanding of the state of the art, understanding 
what technology uh, has changed, how it impacts an investigation, staying current with the, the behavior of applications on systems and how they affect the file system and the evidence that may be left behind, and how the introduction of, of new uh, technology can change things. Uh, for instance, in private browsing modes uh, for web browsers and understanding how that may uh, make uh, it more difficult to recover certain types of evidence. So there are many uh, different tasks that the analyst must perform. Now, each forensic analyst uh, typically will follow a structured model in their approach to analyzing evidence. The thing is though, because digital forensics is a relatively young field, there uh, is not really any one single major standard model that everyone uses, but instead there are several different models that uh, could be used. Many of these models will break up uh, the investigation into multiple steps, some of them up into 11 different steps. But the model we're looking at on the slide here is a generic computer forensic investigation model that was uh, put forth in 2011. And it, it keeps it into five fairly simple phases. We've got a pre-process phase uh, where we're going to be preparing for forensics, gathering our tools, getting uh, trained on the particular platforms that we need experience on. Uh, and then from there, we're going to move to acquisition and preservation, where we're actually gathering and preserving the evidence. We take that evidence uh, back to our forensic lab and we perform our analysis on it, trying to identify what was done with that system and who did it, if we can. We're putting together a timeline, a narrative that explains exactly what has happened on that system to show that perhaps the person knowingly took certain actions and uh, showing that it was actually an intentional behavior. And then, of course, we may have to go into presentation where we're going to, yes, document and report, but we may also have to present our findings uh, in court. And then we have post process activities where we may clean up our work product and of course have to possibly preserve that evidence for many years until all legal appeals may have been exhausted with relationship to that particular case. Now preparing for a forensic investigation uh, is going to require the analyst to uh, have proper knowledge. One of the uh, key guidelines uh, for a digital forensic analyst is that you should never exceed your knowledge. And so it's critical that if you're going to perform an investigation, you be well trained and have deep understanding of many things like the particular hardware you might be examining and especially the operating systems that you'll be working on because each operating system uh, handles the file system differently. Processes and network connections may be uh, managed differently in memory and uh, this is going to be absolutely critical to have a clear understanding of how to trace events through a system. They need to have a solid understanding of the operating systems on different types of devices as well, not just desktops and notebooks, but of course today we've got uh, mobile devices that run various different operating systems, Android, iOS, and so on, uh, network devices that might run their own operating systems as well, understanding how each of those will audit or, or log information so that we can later on audit to record exactly what has occurred on those devices. So uh, this is a, a critical, having all of this knowledge uh, in a very broad base, but also very deep knowledge so that we can understand and explain to others in a court of law uh, exactly how the operating system works, how the software works, and how it affects the temporary files that might be created, timestamps, and other values that help us to put together that timeline or sequence of events. Now, the examiner also must be very familiar with the tools of the trade, the forensic tools that they're going to be using. And there are many of these, many available that are uh, free, many that are proprietary commercial tools. And we'll look at some of those a little bit later in this particular session as well. 
Today, virtualization is being used very commonly, and so uh, the analyst needs to understand how a virtualized environment may affect their ability to collect evidence and how to go about that collection in an effective way. On all organizations, uh, there may in fact be certain systems that are so critical to the function of the organization that any downtime at all uh, would be uh, would create a very large impact to the organization. And so the analyst needs to understand which systems need to be kept up at all costs, basically. So the challenge here, of course, is that it's usually very difficult for the analyst to capture the same depth of information from a system that is up and operating. The initial volatile information may be captured in that way, but in order to obtain a forensic image of the storage media, the hard drives, generally we have to shut the operating system down or turn the system off in order to capture the contents of that drive using an external imaging program. And of course, if you've got a system that must stay up, even though it may have uh, evidence on it, that could hamper the investigation. And so we do need to know how to work around that, but also understand that uh, we are trying to protect the organization from harm, and the forensic investigation uh, has that same goal. It's trying to identify perhaps the root cause of a particular incident, and in so doing, uh, help to avoid that from occurring again in the future, which reduces the risk to the organization. So at the same time, we don't want to introduce new risk by shutting down critical systems, obviously. Uh, staying current with any applicable laws and regulations that involve uh, personal privacy laws, which can be a big one, uh, government regulations uh, related to the need to notify if there's certain data breaches, uh, laws related to required notification and disclosure for certain types of crimes may be applicable. And so again, these laws will vary from area to area, but we have to know the laws and regulations that would apply where we sit, but also potentially where the perpetrator may be, because there could be completely different laws that would apply. What's happened in our state or country uh, may be considered a crime, whereas where the perpetrator is sitting, they may not view what was done as a crime because it's simply not a law that uh, has been put on the books, as it were. And so if uh, an investigator were to have an incomplete understanding of the law and how it affects uh, digital forensics, then it could taint the investigation and make the evidence useless. And so we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, it's uh, very important that if you're going to be doing any type of digital forensics that we have a policy regarding that, that uh, will define the procedures that need to be followed, the legal basis uh, for the investigation, and uh, make sure that when, if we do have that policy that defines uh, how forensics will be performed in our organization, that the policy and the procedures are followed in every single investigation. Because again, if the uh, a lawyer can't challenge the evidence, then they may challenge uh, how it was gathered, the person who gathered it, anything to try to introduce any type of doubt uh, into its veracity. And so we certainly wouldn't want that to happen. Now, during an investigation, uh, often the forensic investigator will be looking for something in particular. Uh, perhaps the organization believes that some type of fraud has occurred on one of their systems, and so the system may be seized and uh, we will begin our forensic analysis. Now, during that forensic analysis, the analyst may identify evidence that may point to something else that is also going on on the system, something separate from the incident that's being investigated. And so we need to have, uh, ideally, uh, guidance in our policies that uh, will define how this should be handled. But in general, we're going to have to escalate to get authority uh, and a decision as to where to go from there. We can check with management to find out with whether uh, we should 
follow the trail of the new evidence because it may actually uh, dovetail into our existing investigation or we may treat that as a separate case and investigate it later on or perhaps the management may decide not to pursue that particular line of investigation. The, the challenge here is that as we find a lot of these additional little uh, forks or branches in our investigation, it could make the investigation uh, too large to be cost effective. And these investigations can take a lot of time and they can cost a lot of money, especially if we're outsourcing. Uh, you might see a typical investigation of a single system regarding a single instant to take approximately a, a week, maybe 40 man hours. And uh, consultants often will charge $250 an hour for this type of investigation. So you can see it's very expensive. And even internally, if we're doing it using our own internal teams, of course, there's still a cost associated with it. So we have to make sure that we scope the investigation properly and that the organization is actually going to receive a cost benefit back from performing that investigation. Now, in uh, some cases, uh, if we get outside of our scope, it could muddy our investigation. And uh, of course, if we don't obtain proper authorization for furthering a new line of investigation, it could actually harm the investigation and put the evidence that we're collecting in jeopardy. And so we always want to make sure we have proper authorization to proceed. One of the main things that uh, we're going to try to do as uh, we do our investigation is we're going to try to put together a timeline that allows us to build a sequential narrative that describes who did what and when they did it and by putting these steps together, we often will not only be able to describe what happened on the machine, but we may also be able to demonstrate that the person taking those actions knew what they were doing and they proceeded with full intent to commit whatever act they committed, which of course would be our, one of our goals. Now, one of the things that's going to be very helpful in the investigation, of course, is going to be timestamps. Now, timestamps are going to be placed on things like log file entries. Uh, timestamps are also going to be placed on files in the file system. Now, in order for this to be easy to aggregate all of the information that we might be analyzing in the crime scene, things like logs from your uh, routers, logs from your firewall, uh, IDS logs, logs from the host that may have been impacted, and other types of logs, it's important that all of the systems in our environment ideally will have a synchronized time clock. Uh, that is, uh, there's always going to be a certain amount of time skew on every platform because the hardware clocks will slowly drift away from reality. But at the same time, we should use a protocol like NTP to point all of those systems to a common trusted time source, ideally something internal, so it's less likely to be compromised. But we could use maybe a GPS type time source box that you can slide in your network rack, point your devices there, and that way all of your timestamps on all of your logs and your files are going to be fairly accurate. Uh, during the investigation, uh, the analyst is going to before they shut down a system, they want to record the actual current time on that system relative to an accurate time source so that any type of uh, offset from that accurate time source can be taken into account when log files and file timestamps are being aggregated and analyzed. And so that in this way, we can align all of the different log entries to a accurate time source. And by doing that and documenting what was done, then again in court, we can show that just because a timestamp on a log entry uh, places two events out of sequence, we can explain that the actual system clock on that device was not accurate. And because of that, that puts the events back into the correct sequence, but we must record that. Now, uh, having that accurate time source is great, uh, but more than that, we also need to understand how timestamps work on a system. You see, each operating system is typically going to maintain 
three different timestamp values on every file in the file system. Now these are called the MAC times. Now the MAC time uh, is simply uh, the modified, accessed, and created time stamps. So the MAC time. And when we look at the uh, modified, accessed, and created timestamps, the trouble here is, is that each operating system deals with these differently. And in fact, some operating systems don't even record certain values. Now, it's critical for an analyst to understand this. And uh, so what I wanted to show you briefly is uh, here, there's a neat article from Dr. Dobbs' journal. And this is in, let's see here, I'm going to try and zoom in here. There we go. www.drdobbs.com. What are MAC times? Uh, slash 18440425. And of course, you could just, you know, Google uh, Dr. Dobbs, what are MAC times and find the article. But this is a great a little article, very short, but it helps us to understand some of the differences between how the file system on a Linux computer or a Windows computer uh, differs in their handling of Mac times. So it just gives you a, a nice example of uh, how these work together. So once we understand how our timestamps are generated, then we're going to be able to record uh, a, and describe an accurate timeline of events, put together that uh, believable narrative of events, and of course, as we do this, we understand we could be looking at thousands and thousands of these files and log entries. And so usually we want to have a tool that's going to help us to manage that. Many of our forensic tools do have those capabilities. In order for evidence to be useful in court, it must uh, conform with the uh, rules of evidence. And depending upon the country you're in, the rules of evidence may vary, but one of the things that's typically required is that the evidence must be shown to be authentic. And so we have to be able to show that it's valid, it's true evidence, that it hasn't been tampered with or compromised in some way. Now, some types of evidence are going to be easier to authenticate than others. Uh, for an example, if we are going to take a digital forensic image of a hard drive, in order to prove that our copy of that hard drive is exactly identical to the original hard drive, we may use a hashing algorithm to calculate a hash value for the original drive and the hash value of the copy. And of course, if the two hash values are identical, the courts have taken that as proof that they are in fact exact identical replicas of each other. Now that hashing function can actually be extended to every single file on the file system that we operate on as well. And so that's one way of authenticating evidence and it's a very common mechanism. But we also may need to authenticate other types of evidence as well. Some types of evidence might be difficult to, to, to verify just because we may not have direct access to all of the uh, uh, low-level logs related to that. So financial transactions may be difficult to trace, for an example, because we don't have control over the bank. Uh, and so what we're going to be able to prove through our investigation may vary depending upon the evidence that's available. Now, I want to uh, show you uh, another example here uh, that we can look at related to evidence. And this is on the Cornell University uh, website. Uh, and these are in the United States, the federal rules of evidence. And the federal rules of evidence uh, give us uh, guidance as to how evidence will be considered by a judge to determine its admissibility. And so the website there, https uh, www.law.cornell.edu slash rules slash FRE, federal rules of evidence. Okay, so as we look at the federal rules of evidence, uh, I'm just going to scroll down to one that we're talking about right now, which is rule uh, 901 authenticating or identifying evidence. And when you choose that rule, it will show uh, how evidence can be authenticated. So for an example, a witness can testify uh, that has knowledge. He can testify that the evidence is what they claim it to be. And you can see some of the different ways of identifying whether evidence is authentic or not. And so, 
these are some of the rules that a judge would follow in examining uh, evidence. There's an interesting one as well, interesting rule of evidence uh, that I'll just jump to here just as another example. That's 803, which is uh, exceptions to the hearsay rule. And the reason I point to this one is that, of course, hearsay is secondhand knowledge. And it's very difficult, well, next to it, it's impossible really to present hearsay in court because it can't be cross-examined. It's not first-person knowledge. And, uh, of course, the interesting thing here is that our computer records are considered or would be considered to be hearsay because of their nature, but there is an exception here under uh, Federal Rules of Evidence 803, Section 6, uh, where records of a regularly conducted activity can be admitted as evidence if the record was made at or near the time of the event. It was kept as a normal part of your business activity. So you've got your uh, logging set up uh, uh, on your systems, and this is a standard thing that you do. That's a regular practice of your activity. In other words, you haven't singled somebody out and targeted them that uh, the, these records are entered into the testimony by the custodian of the records. So perhaps the system administrator or the system operator can sit in uh, court and testify that, yes, these are the records from that system and I'm entering them into evidence. And uh, if you follow those rules, then yes, your computer records are acceptable as evidence in court, but only because of this particular rule of evidence. So anyway, the point is, is that as a, a forensic analyst, we need to be aware of the laws and how they may affect the handling of evidence, the type of evidence that may be useful uh, in court. And of course, we understand the need that we have to prove that that evidence is actually authentic. Now, one of the things that is going to be absolutely critical is maintaining the chain of custody. This is a record of evidence handling that records who collected the evidence and then who they handed it to next and what that person did with it. And we're going to continue to track that chain of evidence every time the evidence is signed out of our evidence locker for any use. Then, of course, we need to make sure that we're tracking and managing that so that we know that Every single person in the entire chain of handling uh, has logged what they've done, the tools they've used, why they were working on the evidence. And of course, every one of those individuals will likely be uh, cross-examined in court to determine whether they actually preserved the integrity of the evidence while it was in their care or not. And so, you know, a good example uh, here of um, something that uh, might be useful would be a evidence collection form. Now, this form that I'm showing you is actually an army form. It's a A4137. You can Google that, A4137. And it's a nice a PDF fillable document that you could use as a basis for your own form or even just use this form. But you can see that it allows us to record what is going on, the receiving activity, where it's occurring, why the evidence is being obtained and the time that it's being obtained. And then we've got a place where we can list the items that we're working on, how many of items uh, they are, and of course, what type of item that we have collected along with unique identifying features. And of course, we document all of the different uh, devices uh, and components that we are uh, seizing or collecting. Uh, this would include all of the peripherals that would be attached and involved. And, of course, they'd all need to have all of their labels and the ports that they're connected to labeled so that we can reconnect everything in exactly the same way they were uh, at the scene. We're going to photograph all those connections, make sure that we have multiple ways of documenting exactly how everything was formed. And then, of course, we start the chain of custody. So once we have collected our information, item number one, we would uh, fill in our particular date that we're working at, uh, perhaps. And then we provide a signature of the person uh, who is releasing the evidence. And we, the person who is accepting responsibility for that. And 
we will then describe what is being done with the evidence. And of course, every time the evidence is checked out of the evidence locker, then a person needs to sign it out and release control to the next person who is accepting responsibility for that evidence. So this gives us a, a, a nice look at uh, how the chain of custody can be preserved. And of course, we have to do that all the way through to at the very end, when we finally realize that this evidence is no longer uh, pertinent uh, perhaps the case has run its course. There is no longer any possible legal use for the evidence, which again could take many, many years, six, seven years in a lot of cases. At that point, then perhaps we will dispose of the evidence. And so we will actually sign uh, the destruction of the evidence so that we've got that documented as well. So those are just some examples related to how the chain of custody may be maintained. And the whole goal is to avoid any type of accusation of tampering with the evidence uh, so that, of course, in court, uh, we can rely on that evidence and the judge and jury will be able to look at the evidence and make an appropriate uh, ruling based on it. Another thing that our forensic analyst is going to need to be, do, be able to do is to communicate effectively with others that are involved in the investigation. And uh, so the scope of the investigation may vary. The interaction with outside parties may vary. But in some cases, uh, the analyst may need to either call in experts uh, in order to assist with portions of the investigation that they're unfamiliar. Again, don't exceed your training. So if you're a skilled forensic analyst and you've done a lot of work with Windows systems, but a case involves a Mac computer, an Apple Mac, or maybe a Linux box, it's a whole new scenario. And so we wouldn't want to cut our teeth uh, for the very first time on an unknown operating system like that, especially if it's a significant case. But instead, we'd bring in an expert, work under their tutelage and learn as we go, hopefully obtain additional training. And then maybe in the future, that analyst could perform the work on similar systems. Uh, mobile devices, again, they're another uh, unique area. So with, if you don't have training on the platforms, on the operating system, systems and with the specific tools that are used, then it would be best to obtain help from someone who does. In some cases, we're going to need to also coordinate with law enforcement. And this, of course, would be required in some cases. For instance, in many countries, any instance or suspicion uh, that there may be child pornography involved in a case uh, it will usually immediately trigger a call to law enforcement in order for them to take over the investigation. Now, of course, understand that once you involve law enforcement, there are other legal issues that may come into play. For instance, in the United States, there are statutes that, of course, protect people from unreasonable search and seizure. This is uh, part of one, one of the amendments uh, to the Constitution. And so this means that in order for law enforcement to become involved in the case, they must obtain the proper legal basis for that. So uh, they may have to obtain uh, uh, search warrants and various other things, uh, depending, again, upon the rules of evidence that apply. The Law enforcement, often when they become involved, they may seize the systems. And so we must be prepared for that. If uh, a system is involved in some type of crime where we need to involve law enforcement, we have to be ready for the fact that those systems may be seized. And if they are seized, we may not see them for a very, very long time. Now, we also, as the analyst, need to make sure that we can share information effectively related to, to the investigation, uh, have regular uh, scheduled communications, ideally, so that everyone is kept in the loop. And uh, in this way, make sure that uh, all those participating in the investigation are going to be the most effective. We know that the analyst needs to be familiar with their tools. And uh, so as we run down this list, you'll see there are a bunch of tools listed here. And uh, one of them, the top one is the TSK, which is the Sleuth Kit. Now, this is a uh, free open source forensic toolkit that runs on top of uh, Linux primarily, but I believe there's also a, a Windows uh, edition for this. And uh, in our session three of our activity together here of this course, 
uh, we're going to use the autopsy front end uh, for the sleuth kit uh, to do an examination of a disk image of a USB drive that we captured as part of an incident that I'll be describing to you in uh, the next slide or two here. So you'll have a look at that tool. Uh, Encase is a commercial tool from Guidance Software, and uh, it's uh, one of the leading digital forensic uh, tool sets. Uh, most uh, serious uh, forensic analysts are going to typically use Encase, or they may use FTK for their primary investigation platform, and then they may use other tools as well. Uh, if they're getting involved with uh, mobile forensics, there's other players in the game like Paraben, that have large toolkits that are specifically tailored for mobile forensics. But one of those two are very, very common, and they're probably uh, the leaders uh, in the proprietary forensic software uh, environment. Uh, we have uh, Kane, which is another open source Linux distribution. And as I mentioned, we've got the FTK, the Forensics Toolkit. and this uh, forensics toolkit is from a company called Access Data. And they actually do give away a few free things like the FTK Imager, which is a nice little tool for creating disk images and RAM images. Uh, and uh, so if you wanna snag that tool, you can download that one uh, for free. Uh, we have uh, SIFT, uh, which is the SANS Investigative Forensic Toolkit, which is also an open source uh, set of tools that runs on uh, Linux. Uh, we've got uh, DFF, the Digital Forensics Framework, which is also an open source, a general purpose forensic tool. And we have Coffee. Now, Coffee, interestingly, is a tool that was created by Microsoft for use by law enforcement. And uh, unless you're involved with government and law enforcement, you can't get a copy of Coffee. But it's uh, very cool because it's uh, designed so that people with minimal training can be equipped with coffee on a USB stick, they can plug it into a system and through the scripts on the uh, USB stick, the person uh, who has uh, that basic training can capture the necessary forensic information uh, in order to then shut down and seize that computer, take it back to the lab. So nice little tool uh, that's a gift from Microsoft to law enforcement. We have Windows Scope, uh, which is a proprietary tool we would use for analyzing RAM captures. Now, the contents of RAM is significant in many investigations today because in, in many cases, individuals uh, and criminals are starting to encrypt their hard drives. And if we do have a system that's got a encrypted hard drive or encrypted files, many times the decryption key will be stored in RAM while the system is operating. So. This means that if we can uh, obtain uh, that copy of the key from memory, then we'll be able to decrypt the drive. And if we can't do that, then we may lose all possibility of doing uh, forensic analysis on that system. So one of the first steps in many investigations is going to be to capture that volatile information. And uh, that would include getting a snapshot of memory that we could then analyze. And so Windows Scope is for analyzing those snapshots, as is Volatility. Uh, Volatility is an open source uh, tool, runs on Windows and Linux, and it's a command line tool that allows us to analyze the contents of RAM. It'll do things like, uh, you know, show you encryption keys, certain types of encryption keys. It'll show you the processes that we're running on the system, um, various, uh, you know, uh, files that were open, and so on. It gives you quite an extensive view of what was happening on the system when it was running. Now, of course, to prove the authenticity of information, we're gonna use hashing. So we've got hashing tools like Hash My Files and HashKeeper. Foremost is another tool that we would use that's Linux-based, and it's used for data recovery and file carving. Now, data recovery, of course, would be used to recover things like deleted files, uh, but file carving is used to uh, carve out files that have been disconnected from any file system, uh, carve out files that perhaps have had portions of them destroyed, uh, files that we find uh, in uh, what we call the slack space of the cluster or slack space on a partition, which would be 
areas that at one time had information written to them uh, that is no longer in use because uh, those areas had been reallocated but not overwritten. And so uh, we can use tools like Foremost to do that. Also, uh, Test Disk does a similar thing. It'll help us to recover deleted files and formatted drives. And the same organization that creates Test Disk, uh, which is, by the way, a free cross-platform tool, uh, they also create one called PhotoRec. And it's you know, the name sounds like it's used to recover photographs, and it can be. But what it does is it scans a system and does file carving, looking for file headers that identify uh, recognized files and then writes them out to a file system so that you can then view those files and file fragments that have been found. We know that uh, timelines are very critical to our investigation, and so we could use a tool like log to timeline which is an open source timeline generation tool that will allow us to aggregate a large number of log entries uh, and then create a timeline that uh, allows us to show the sequence of events. Some of our investigations are going to include network analysis as well, and so a tool like Wireshark can be invaluable in doing the uh, analysis of those communications. Now, when you're looking for forensic tools, you're starting out, you may not want to spend a lot of money, and so finding free tools is great. In, uh, of course, our uh, full version of the course, uh, we would uh, be using a copy of Kali Linux that contains uh, many different uh, forensic and penetration testing tools. And so Kali Linux is a great source for information uh, and for tools. But uh, we do have many, many, many individual computer forensic tools that are available. And this website is an excellent low source to obtain those. Uh, you can see here, it's uh, HTTPS uh, forensiccontrol.com slash resources slash free hyphen software. And uh, when you look at uh, this forensic control website, you'll note, of course, that that URL is in your courseware as well. But uh, this lists over 140 free tools. And as you look down the list, you can see they are c categorized by what they do. And then as you look at these, we've got imaging tools um, as an example. So one nice imaging tool I could point you to right out of the gate here is the Live RAM Capturer from Belkasoft. This tool, it's free. It's lightweight, which is important for a RAM capturing tool because it doesn't have a big footprint, so it doesn't damage a large area of your memory. And it's got a 32 and a 64-bit version, so you can capture smaller amounts of memory, but also many gigabytes of memory that we have on today's systems. So that's just an example, but there's so many tools here. Spend some time and look through the list and investigate some of the tools that are offered here. Okay, There's just an endless list of them, really. So with that, you can see that we do have a tremendous number of tools available to us. And so when we're going to begin our forensic investigation, there are many uh, best practices we might want to follow. And this guideline slide will be reflected on the checklist tile inside of the logical choice or LO choice uh, website, where I pointed out the checklists tile to you. But as it says, we should develop a plan as to how we're going to handle our forensic tasks, uh, have guidelines and procedures in place, uh, make sure that our forensic systems are set up properly to collect evidence. And one of these things, for an example, would be having adequate storage space to collect our disk images and having a write blocking device that will allow us to connect an evidence drive up to our disk copying system in such a way that we can guarantee that there is no way that that original evidence drive could be modified in any way. Because, of course, in a court, we're going to need to be able to prove that the original evidence has not been modified or tampered with. And by having a write blocker in line, that's going to be a, a big part of that. For some investigations, we may be able to get away with simply mounting the drive using the Linux operating system, using a read-only operator when we actually mount that file system. And that's an option, but a hardware write blocker is typically going to be uh, more trustworthy and e more easily explained in a court of law. <laughs> um, 
And of course, we may want to consider developing our own internal capability to perform digital forensics, uh, even if we're not going to be able to do the full scope of an investigation. If we have the skills and training to capture volatile information and to capture a forensic image of our drives and maintain the custody of that evidence, that may be adequate in case a case occurs, we can do that and then hand that information, that evidence over to more skilled investigators to actually perform the investigation. But at least it means that we won't have to wait for someone to be able to come in to do those things for us. And that means we're going to be able to get our systems back into a functioning state that much more quickly. As I mentioned, uh, this uh, course is based around a security incident uh, that where an individual uh, tried to compromise an organization's security. And so the particulars of the incident are described here. First, the uh, intruder tried to access Charles' account remotely, but was unable to do so. Then we noticed that Linda accessed the research and development server from her internal workstation at 7.43 a.m., but Linda's on vacation. And so it, this would be a red flag. Now, then the attacker would uh, take the log on on Linda's computer, and it was found that uh, the attacker had discovered Linda's password written down maybe on a post-it note that was inside her drawer, and we've all seen mistakes like that made. The attacker was able to use Linda's password to log into her workstation and then access that R&D server. Once they had access to the R&D server, they copied a schematic for a smartwatch off to Linda's workstation and then copied it to a USB drive. Then the attacker deleted that document from Linda's workstation, ejected the removable drive, and left. And so, of course, this is a data exfiltration issue that's occurred here. Now, the incident responders have already responded to this particular incident. And if you were with us for the our earlier uh, short course on responding to a cybersecurity incident, you would have discussed some of that. And during the incident response, we would have uh, perhaps uh, isolated the affected systems to try to minimize the potential impact or spread of the incident to, to other areas of the network. Uh, we'd uh, scanned those systems looking for malware to see if there was any malware involved because that could impact our investigation. And uh, then those effective hosts would be taken out of commission until they can be further investigated. And we might put a new machine back into the R&D location and restore a trusted backup to that system. Re-enable Charles' account because his wasn't compromised. Uh, Linda maybe will be given a temporary workstation and some additional training, and she'll have to reset her password, of course. And then uh, out of that instant response, we'd have an after action report that would come out of our lessons learned meeting and our after action meeting and there would be some recommendations that were made to the organization like the need to encrypt sensitive data uh, have better training for our users have proper security policies concerning password usage and possibly implement a data loss prevention solution uh, to help to avoid problems like this in the future so that's a lead in to our activity 11-1, where we would be applying a forensic investigation plan. The scenario for this activity says that under the CISOs or CISOs authorization, the cybersecurity incident response team has handed off their work to you, a forensic investigator for Develtech. Your company's forensic model follows the basic pattern, preparation, acquisition, analysis, presentation, and review. Using this model, you'll begin to develop a plan for each phase of the process. This plan will help you perform all of your investigative duties to the best of your ability and hopefully will make it easier for you to discover the source of this data breach. So now what I'd like you to do is uh, perhaps pause the recording, look at the three questions that are listed here and attempt to answer those questions to the best of your ability. And after you've spent a little bit of time considering those, then restart the recording and we'll discuss the answers together.
Okay, so how did you do? In question number one, you were asked, what must you know about the Veltex computing environments to prepare for a forensic investigation? Well, there are many different things that uh, would be helpful, but certainly the investigator should know about the hardware, the operating systems, other pieces of software that may be used and the way that they interact with the operating system, whether virtualization is being used, and have a good, strong familiarity and training with the different forensic tools that might be used in the investigation. Further, if there's any systems that need to be able to stay up and keep them active, we need to be aware of those and a good, solid understanding of any applicable laws or regulations would be helpful. Question two asks, Linda's workstation has a real-time anti-malware scan running when the computer is powered on. One of your team members had the idea of looking at those logs, even though no malware was detected in the incident response phase. He reviewed the logs, and the smartwatch schematic 3.png file was detected as the scanner swept the USB drive that was attached at the time of intrusion. Because the anti-malware solution keeps logs of some of the files it scans, when it scanned the USB drive, it captured the names of some other files that were on the USB drive. How can an analysis of these anti-malware logs help your investigation? Well, by looking at uh, the different files that may have been detected during that scan, they might find unique file names that uh, can be located either on file servers on the network or other workstations on the network that could tie the possession or ownership of that USB drive back to a particular person. And in this way, we could possibly identify the culprit who inserted the USB drive into the system. Question number three asks, an analysis of the anti-malware logs did not immediately reveal any identifying information. There were no names attached to any of the logged files, and most of them were vague enough not to be tied to a single person or group of people. However, the team searched for each file name in the company's network storage space provisioned to each employee. This search produced one result. The file My Contract Invoice 3 DocX exists in the network storage space of an employee named Rupert. Your investigation isn't done, but you think you've gathered enough evidence to present to your supervisor so that you can take action. What are some of the important steps involved in upholding the integrity of your investigation? How can you better convince your audience of your findings? Well, of course, one of the key things you need to do here is maintain the chain of custody of the evidence, don't you? We need to document also who may have last worked on each computer, what was done on each of those systems. Uh, we're going to try to think about how the evidence uh, that we've identified can be authenticated. How can we prove that it's uh, true, authentic, trustworthy evidence? And uh, also uh, how we're going to be able to demonstrate that the evidence has not been tampered with. And so, of course, we would want to consider hashing any files or images that are found so that, again, we can uh, prove that they have integrity. So this brings our uh, activity to a close. And so what I want you to, of course, consider now is where do we go from here? So if you want to learn more information about the cybersecurity first responder certification and the training that you can take in order to obtain that certification, reach out to Logical Operations. Uh, the contact information is shown on the slide there, either phone, email, or go to the website. And uh, if you do so, you can learn uh, why the certification is important and relevant uh, and how to uh, obtain it and where you can obtain the training that will prepare you for that certification as well. So I look forward to seeing you in session two of this uh, short course on investigating cybersecurity incidents.